We're back looking at the kings of Israel and Judah. Still looking at King Ahaz. Last time we looked at him in 2 Kings chapter 16. He's also in Isaiah chapter 7. But he's also in 2 Chronicles chapter 28. While the 1 and 2 Kings gives you a, a closer look at the kings of Israel. The Chronicles will give you a closer look at the kings of Judah. And Ahaz is a king of Judah. So we're actually going to find even more stuff about him in 2 Chronicles 28. Now it's going to be a lot of the same stuff, but you're going to have a lot of stuff that you didn't have in 2 Kings chapter 16. So last time we talked about King Ahaz and how he's just dead wrong. That was the theme last time. We talked about in 2 Kings 16 how he was hanging with the wrong people, going to the wrong places, had the wrong plans, the wrong pattern, and this led him to having the wrong plot line. So we're going to continue with that, him being dead wrong. But we're going to look at Second Chronicles chapter 28 and continue with looking at how he's dead wrong. Now here's you a good little introduction for Ahaz to refresh your memory. Ahaz means possessor. He is the 11th king of Judah. And he reigns 16 years. His spiritual state, you guessed it, evil. His father is Jotham. His prophets are Odad and Isaiah. He ruled during Pekah, the king of Israel's reign. His age at death is 36. So, he uh, kind of like a rock star age there. The average age of a rock star is around that age. Uh, his texts are... 2 Kings 16, 2 Chronicles 28, and Isaiah chapter 7. So 2 Chronicles 28, let's look at some things about King Ahaz and how he's dead wrong. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign. So a young age to become a king over so many people. And he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. So somebody was born when he started reigning and... He continued to reign until that same person was driver's license age. 16 years. That's a pretty long time if you think about it. He did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord like David his father. They're all compared to David. Because David is the standard. He's the best king. David is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the standard for us. We should be striving to be like David the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like these guys should have been at least striving to be like King David. They would have had the Psalms. They would have had stuff wrote about David, the example of him. They would have had, you know, his son's writings, Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs. They could have read that, figured out the way they should go as a king. But nope, they did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord, like David. David's the standard for good kings, just like all the bad kings are compared to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, it says in verse 2, and made also molten images for Balaam. So, what does that show us? He's got the wrong God. He makes molten images for Balaam. And let's look at some other verses in Jeremiah 32. If you go to Jeremiah 32 and verse 35 Jeremiah 32 35 it says and they built the high places of Baal which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech which I commanded them not neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin but that's exactly what Ahaz is doing. In Second Chronicles 28 and verse 3, it says, Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom, the place where we just read about, and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So he not only has the wrong God, he's got the wrong sacrifice. He's got the wrong sacrifices here. He's sacrificing his own children in the fire 
He's also making sacrifices in the wrong places. You know, he's not supposed to be making sacrifices in high places. He's not supposed to be making sacrifices with his own children because, as you just read in Jeremiah 32, 35, it never came into the Lord's mind for people to do this. Burning your children in the fire? Romans 131 talks about this uh, state of mind people get into where they are without natural affection. Killing your own kid is being without natural affection. Leviticus 18.21 also talks about this. Uh, it says, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. So he would have definitely known that this was wrong. But he burnt his children through the fire anyway. One of the forbidden practices in Deuteronomy 18 and verse 10, it says, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire. So he would have read about it over and over again, but instead he's, he's burning incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burning his children in the fire. And... He's burning his children in the fire, through the fire to Moloch. And Tophet is the worship place in the valley of the son of Hinnom, where he would be going. He's going to the wrong places, as we talked about last week. He's hanging out with the wrong people. He's got the wrong God, and it's leading him to having the wrong sacrifices. Now, for today, for me and you, Jesus Christ is our perfect sacrifice. We put our faith in Him, and He saved us. We're saved eternally. And then after we're saved, we need to present our bodies a living sacrifice. That is, just when we get up in the morning, you say, what would the Lord have me do today? And then you go do it. But He's going to this, going to the Tophet, that worship place in the valley of the son of Hinnom, burning incense in there, making his son or daughter to pass through the fire, making molten images for Balaam, those Old Testament false gods, Baal, Moloch. It says in Joshua eighteen sixteen, And the border came down to the end, end of the mountain that lieth before the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is in the valley of the giants on the north, and descended to the valley of Hinnom to the side of Jebusai on the south, and descended to Enrogel. So that valley of the son of Hinnom is in the valley of the giants. You see, he's doing the same stuff that those heathen giants were doing way back when. Making his son or daughter to pass through the fire, things like that. Really perverted stuff. It says in verse 4 of Second Chronicles 28, He sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high places, going to the wrong places, and on the hills, and under every green tree. So he's got the wrong location. He's, he's got the wrong locations going on. He's Not only is he doing the wrong sacrifice, he's going to the wrong places. If, if uh, he was going to do sacrifices, and do the right sacrifices, he wouldn't be have, sacrificing his children. He'd be sacrificing the blood of an animal in the temple. Not at the high places not on the hills and under every green tree. They like to do it under every green tree up in the high places because the shadow thereof is good. Hosea 4.13 says, And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They like the shadow under them trees. It says, Wherefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria. And they smote him and carried away a great multitude of them captives and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with the great slaughter. So the king of Syria is Rezin, and the king of Israel at the time is Pekah. <clears throat> and he's getting enemies on every side. Because when you live for the devil, the Lord is going to raise up enemies against you. In hopes to maybe have you turn to him. And it says in verse 6, For Pekah, the son of Remaliah, slew in Judah a hundred and twenty thousand in one day, 
which were all valiant men because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. So 120,000 men here were killed who wasted their skill to just serve devils. They were serving devils and they ended up into the hands of the enemy. They could have been valiant men for the Lord, but they forsook the Lord God of their fathers. And this is why the, the Lord allowed Pekah to slay them. But look at how that's worded. It, it says, For Pekah the son of Remaliah slew in, in Judah 120,000 in one day, which were all valiant men, because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. If you look at it a certain way, it kind of looks like Pekah is killing them because they would forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. But that's not why. Uh, you see, the Lord delivered them into the hands of Pekah because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. Pekah, the son of Remaliah, did not care that they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers because he himself had forsaken the Lord God of his father. So, <clears throat> it wasn't because Pekah was trying to be a good guy for the Lord. It's just that the Lord was using Pekah as an enemy to bring judgment on Ahaz and Judah. And it says in verse 7, And Zikri, a mighty man of Ephraim, slew Messiah, the king's son, and Azrikim, the governor of the house, and Elkanah, that was next to the king. So you see, um, the people close to Ahaz are all feeling the heat from this. People close to you are affected by your sin. Judah is losing their top rulers. You know, you think that your sin only affects you. No, it affects people close to you. Just like it affects people close to Ahaz. And the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren. 200,000. You see, the children of Israel, Pekah and his people, that's the brethren of the king of Judah. You see, they used to be the United Kingdom. It used to be Israel and Judah together. But, you know, after Rehoboam, uh, he messes up and the kingdom splits. But you see, really, these people are brethren. Israel and Judah are brethren. And the children of Israel carry away captive of their brethren 200,000. Women, sons, and daughters, and took also away much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. And you think about it today, many Bible believers attack their own brethren. And a bad leader will lose his women, his sons, and his daughters, just like King Ahaz. He was losing them. And much spoil, too. Now, verse 9, but a prophet. God always has somebody to step in there and tell you how it is, tell you how things are. He's always got a prophet or a preacher or somebody to step up and say something. He says, but a prophet of the Lord was there whose name was Oded. And he went out before the host that came to Samaria and said unto them, so he's going to Israel here, letting them know about what they're doing is not good. And said unto them, behold, because the Lord God of your fathers was wroth with Judah, he hath delivered them into your hand. You know, telling them the only reason that they're in your hand is because I delivered them to you. That's what the Lord says. And you have slain them in a rage that reacheth up to heaven, reacheth up unto heaven. And now you purpose to keep under the children of Judah and Jerusalem for bondmen and bondwomen unto you, but are there not with you, even with you, sins against the Lord your God? So Israel is being too hard on their brethren. The Lord's the one that delivered them into their hand. It's not because they're such a great people or nothing. It's because the Lord delivered them into their hand. And now they're being too hard on them. They're going to keep, keep them for bond men and bond women. Keep them as slaves. But Odad's like, aren't there even with you sins against the Lord your God? You see, I delivered Judah into your hand because all the, they're, they're sinning against me. But look what you guys are doing. I can easily turn around and deliver you guys into the hands of somebody, which he's going to do because they forsake the Lord God of their fathers. So, 
they're lucky that they still had access to the word of the Lord. God was gracious to them by sending them a prophet to give them this warning. And they, they, they slew Judah in a rage that reaches up unto heaven, higher than the Tower of Babel. That's how far their rage was going up. And it says in verse 11, Hear me therefore, and deliver the captives again, which ye have taken captive of your brethren, for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. So he's like, let them go, deliver the captives again. The fierce wrath of the Lord is upon Israel now. And, you know, John 3.36 talks about how the wrath of God abides on certain people. The wrath of God lays on every lost man. But if you're saved, Romans 5, 9 talks about how you're saved from wrath through Him, through the Lord Jesus Christ. You're delivered from the wrath to come. You need to get out from under the wrath of God and get into the love of God by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in verse 12, Then certain of the heads of the children of Ephraim, Azariah, the son of Johanan, Barakiah, the son of Meshilimoth, and Jehazekiah, the son of Shalom, and Amasa, the son of Hadlai, stood up against them that came from the war. So they stood against them. These people of Israel that heard the preaching of Odad took heed to the preaching, and they stood against them that came from the war. Just like Paul withstood Peter there in Galatians 2.11, you just want to make sure you're standing up for the right thing. Make sure you're standing against uh, something that's not right. Make sure you're not standing against the true Bible believer that's doing right. You know, you don't want to be like Janese and Jambres withstood Moses. You don't want to be like Alexander the coppersmith who was doing Paul much evil in 2 Timothy 4, 14 through 15. You want to be withstanding the right people, not true Bible believers. They heard the preaching of Odad, and they took a stand against those that were coming back from the war with these captives of Judah. And they said unto them, Ye shall not bring in the captives hither, for whereas we have offended against the Lord already, ye intend to add more to our sins and to our trespass, for our trespass is great, and there is fierce wrath against Israel. You see, sometimes you have to stand in the way of someone bringing in something that offends the Lord. Here, it was the captives. Sometimes you got to take a stand against somebody bringing in false doctrine or some type of awful sin in among the people. Or it's just going to bring the fierce wrath of the Lord on everybody. And... It, notice that phrase, you intend to add more to our sins. Every generation does that. Just adds more and more sin. Until the thoughts and imaginations of every man's hearts on the evil continually, and their cup is gets full. The more people sin, the more the cup of God's wrath gets full, and then he just pours it out on them. It says, add more to our sins to our trespass, for our trespass is great, and there is fierce wrath against Israel. Eventually, he's going to take that cup and just pour it out on top of them. It says, so the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the congregation. So these men stood up that heard the preaching of Odad, and they went to these men coming back from the war, and these men coming back from the war, they took heed, to these people's preaching who took a stand. And you see, that's the way it should go. Like a ripple effect. Everybody giving in to what God wants them to do. And the armed men leave the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the congregation. And the men which were expressed by name rose up and took the captives. And with the spoil clothed all that were naked among them. And arrayed them and shod them and gave them to eat and to drink and anointed them. And carried all the feeble of them upon asses, and brought them to Jericho, the city of palm trees, to their brethren. Then they returned to Samaria. So in verses 14 and 15, they restore the brethren. They put clothes on their back, shoes on their feet. They give them uh, food and stuff to drink. 
And the ones that are feeble, they carry them on asses and just show kindness to them, just like the Lord would have them do. And just like in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, it talks about if a man be overtaken in a fault, just like Judah was, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And that's exactly what Israel needed to do, consider their self. They weren't so hot with the Lord either. They needed to be restoring these people that they took captive. That's not what the Lord wanted them to do. He wanted to deliver them into their hand, but they were they were slaying them in a rage that was reaching up unto heaven. They were they were being ruthless and brutal. But they they took heed to the preaching of Oded, and these people stood up against the people coming back from the war, and they delivered the people delivered captives back they restored them now verse 16 it says at that time did king ahaz send unto the king of assyria to help him but another thought about in verse 15 about how they restored the uh, captives you know just just be good to people even enemies you know it talks about that in romans 12 20 be good to them. Be good to your enemies. And, you know, by doing, by Israel doing this kind gesture to Judah, it's like they were doing it for the Lord. Just like in Matthew 25, 35 through 40, uh, there's going to be the judgment of the nations some, uh, sometime in the future at, at the uh, second coming. After the second coming, he's going to have that judgment of the nations. And all the nations are going to be there. And if they were good to the brethren, they're in good shape. If not, they're in bad shape. You know, they're in uh, Matthew 25, 35 through 40. I'll go ahead and read that to you. 25, 35 through 40. He says, For I was unhungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee unhungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw thee we a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king, which is Jesus, shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So by doing this kind gesture to Judah, it's like they were doing it for the Lord. So remember that. Now at that time did King Ahaz send unto the king of Assyria to help him. Once again, you see this, going to the wrong people for help. You don't want to go to the world for help. You want to go to God for help. For again, the Edomites had come and smitten Judah and carried away captives. The Philistines also had invaded the cities of the low country and of the south of Judah and had taken Beth Shemesh and Ajalon and Gedaroth and Shoko with the villages thereof and Timnah with the villages thereof and Gimzo also and the villages thereof and they dwelt there. You see, they come in He's got all these enemies coming against him because he's forsaken the Lord his God. And when you forsake the Lord God, you're going to have enemies coming in. You're opening doors for the enemy to come in. And the, uh, Paul talks about in Ephesians, neither give place to the devil. And he's let all these, all these enemies have come against him. And it says they're coming in these villages thereof and they dwell there. See, when you live a life of wickedness, of sin... And letting the devil in, he's going to come in with unclean spirits, and they're going to dwell there. For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. For he made Judah naked and transgressed sore against the Lord. The, and you see, he brought Judah low. You know, to, to get in high regard with the Lord, you make yourself low. You humble yourself before God. And he'll exalt you in due time. But he made Judah low because he was going to the high places. He was lifted up in his pride. And he makes Judah low. See, the king of Judah here, King Ahaz, look at this. It says, For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. So the king of Judah 
is called the king of Israel here. And this is the second time that the king of Judah is called the king of Israel. The other time was in 2 Chronicles 21.2. But you see what happened was Hosea killed Pekah, the king of Israel, in the final year of Jotham. And he doesn't begin his rule until the 12th year of Ahaz. So before his rule, God considered Ahaz king of Israel. You see that? Hosea killed Pekah in the final year of Jotham, which was Ahaz's father. And Hosea doesn't begin his rule until the 12th year of Ahaz. So before Hosea's rule, God is considering Ahaz not only king of Judah, but also king of Israel. So for like a nine-year period, Ahaz is considered king of Israel and Judah. And he, he made Judah naked and transgressed sore against the Lord. And tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, came unto him and distressed him and strengthened him not. So no strength from the world. Maybe you could get a temporary boost, but then you're just going to crash. And you see, there's no he strengthened him not. And there's no joy of the Lord there because not Nehemiah 8, 10, 8, Nehemiah 8 and verse 10 says, The joy of the Lord is my strength. He has no strength. He's in distress. And you see, he fears men when he should have been fearing God. Fearing God is a stress relief because you won't fear anything else. And it says, For Ahaz took away a portion out of the house of the Lord and out of the house of the king and the princes and gave it unto the king of Assyria, but he helped him not. Once again, helped him not. But the Lord is the one who helps in time of need. Hebrews 4.16 Ahaz took away from the house of the Lord instead of adding to the Lord. He took away from it. And in the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against the Lord? This is that King Ahaz. That's what he's known for. This is that King Ahaz. You see, when men are in distress, they turn to God or they turn to sin. In Ahaz's case, he turned to more sin. And that sin is against the Lord. Psalm 51, 4, against thee and thee only have I sinned. It's like Ahaz versus the Lord. And of course, the Lord's going to win. And he's distressed. And he did not take pleasure in distresses as Paul does in 2 Corinthians twelve ten. He just let it add more sin to his life. He sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, wrong God, which smote him, and he said, Because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, therefore will I sacrifice to them, that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. Iniquity will be your ruin. Ezekiel 18.30 He's got the wrong gods, and as uh, Exodus 20 and verse 3 says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He's, sacrifice, he's got the wrong sacrifice. He says, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. He's got the wrong God, wrong sacrifice. And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God and shut up the doors of the house of the Lord, just like the Democrats want to do. And he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem. Every corner. He had a false church on every corner. What if you had a Bible-believing church on every corner? Imagine that. Well, imagine Ahaz. He had a false church on every corner. You see, some men today love to cut in pieces the things of the Lord. He cut in pieces the Lord's vessels. And today, the Lord's vessels is us. We got this treasure in earthen vessels, as it talks about in 2 Corinthians 4-7. And some people love to cut the saints in pieces today. King Ahaz loved to cut the things of the Lord in pieces, shut the doors on the house of the Lord. Uh, it may be even today, you could say that the Democrats love to shut the doors of utterance. Uh, uh, like Paul talks about in Colossians 4.3, he prayed for a, a door of utterance. In Revelation 3.8, Philadelphia was the church of the open door. And wicked men like to close the doors on you. And in every city, several city of Judah, he made high places to burn incense unto other gods and provoked to anger the Lord God of his fathers. He made sin more convenient. 
He made high places and in every several city. He made sin more convenient. And that's what people is doing today. They love convenience and they love sin, so they're making sin more convenient. Now the rest of his acts and all of his ways, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And he's got the wrong plot line. He's got the wrong story. He wrote for himself the wrong story. And Ahaz slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city, even in Jerusalem. But they brought him not into the sepulchres of the kings of Israel. He ended up with the wrong type of burial. He's not even brought into the sepulchres of the kings. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his stead. And Hezekiah is going to turn out to be a good king, as we'll see next time.